Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm Carrie Ann Wright Cato, the Director of the Office of Climate Change, Technology, and Research at Connecticut Deep. Um, welcome to the Exploring Climate Solutions webinar series. The series is brought to you by the Governor's Council on Climate Change. Last April, Governor Malloy issued an executive order creating the Governor's Council on Climate Change, also known as the GC3. The Council is charged with examining the efficacy of existing policies and regulations designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and identify new strategies to meet the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. The Council is composed of 15 members from state agencies, quasi-state agencies, businesses, and nonprofits. To learn more about the GC3, please go to www.ct.gov slash DEEP slash GC3. The webinar series explores innovative and successful climate change solutions in Connecticut and the nation. This series provides first-hand accounts of high-profile municipal climate programs, climate initiatives in the corporate world, new greenhouse gas reporting frameworks, statewide sustainability programs, low carbon fuel initiatives, and other programs and projects that help reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve climate resilience. Today, we're excited to have Dr. Anthony Leiserowitz, Director of the Yale, climate, or Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, as our guest speaker. Dr. Leiserowitz will talk about his research on how and why citizens of the U.S. and around the world are or are not responding to climate change, his research findings on identifying key audiences, and how tailoring communications with these key audiences can lead to broader engagement on climate change solutions. The presentation will be about 40 minutes long, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. If you have a question, please submit your question in the, in the dialog box, and we'll read it aloud for uh, Anthony to respond to. Before we get started, for those of you listening via your computer speakers, and if you're experiencing poor sound quality, I do encourage you to call in using your telephone. Um, with that, Dr. Lysert, thank you for your willingness to present today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you to begin with your presentation. Great. Um, so thank you, Carrie, and thank you to the Governor's Council on Climate Change. It's really a pleasure to be here um, and uh, really am very supportive of, obviously, of the work that you all are doing. So thank you again for the opportunity. Um, let me quickly introduce uh, myself and our program for those of you who don't already know us. Um, so again, my name is Anthony Lajewicz, and I direct the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. We're based at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies uh, here at Yale. Uh, and basically what we try to understand is how do mass publics respond to this issue? Uh, what do people understand and misunderstand about the causes, the consequences, and the solutions to climate change? Um, how do they perceive the risks? So the likelihood and severity of different types of impacts from storms to floods uh, to droughts, et cetera. Uh, what kinds of policies do they support or oppose? And that what kinds of behaviors are people engaged in around climate and energy? And when we talk about behavior, we mostly look at four main buckets or types of behavior. Uh, the first is how people actually use or conserve or waste energy uh, at home and on the road. Uh, secondly is consumer behavior. To what extent will people prefer the products and services that will reduce their own contributions to climate change? Uh, also, though, we look at to what extent are they willing to essentially express their concerns about climate change through their purchasing? So you can think of boycotts or bycotts. Uh, you know, to what extent will people basically try to send a market signal uh, uh, about climate change? Uh, third is social behavior, including uh, communication. So to what extent do we talk about this issue or more often not talk about this issue, and that's a wider t discussion. Um, and then last but not least is political behavior. Uh, not just do people support policies or not, and not even just do they prefer one uh, uh, you know, uh, candidate versus another, uh, but more, we've been doing a lot more work lately trying to really understand what leads some people to become active citizens, to actually engage with the political system and demand uh, broader systemic change. Um, and then, of course, we are uh, pointy-headed academics and scientists, so our ultimate question is answering the question, why? Uh, what are the underlying psychological, cultural, political reasons why some people get very engaged with this issue, many are kind of apathetic, and some are downright hostile and dismissive? Um, and then, as Carrie just mentioned, we work at many, many different scales. So here I'll be mostly talking about the United States uh, as a whole. But we're increasingly doing uh, a lot of work at state and local levels, and I'll show you some of that work specific to Connecticut uh, in a moment. Um, 
but we also work increasingly at international scales as well. So uh, we recently did the first ever study in China, the first ever study in India, and then with Gallup we've worked in about 120 countries around the world, kind of seeing how humanity as a whole is responding to the issue. So I'm happy to go to any level, any scale, uh, in, if people have questions about that. But for now I'm going to keep our focus primarily on the United States. Um, so with that, uh, let, let's jump in. So, so today I'm going to talk about climate change in the American mind. And uh, I think the first thing I want to say, because I know a lot of people are tuned into this to try to get at, well, how do we navigate this incredibly big, complicated issue? And it is big and complicated. It's as big as the Earth and all of its inhabitants. Um, you know, it, it touches all of our lives in, in so many fundamental ways. Um, and so it's very easy to get lost in the weeds and to get confused and to confuse other people uh, about the many, many complexities of the issue. Um, but, uh, and, and well, and I guess I would go one further step and say that, you know, from an, in an ideal world, we would be able to provide all Americans, in fact, everyone on the planet, the equivalent of Climate Change 101, you know, a, a full semester course dedicated to really understanding, here's what climate change is, here's how the climate system works, uh, you know, here's what the causes are, here are what the consequences, here are the solutions, and, you know, give everyone a really deep and, and you know, pretty sophisticated understanding of that. Uh, but the sad fact is that that's never, ever going to happen, um, especially when you're looking at a country, in, the, in, our, in the U.S. case, of, you know, over 300 million people. Um, now, I'm, when I say that, of course, I'm not uh, uh, denying the fact that there are, in fact, millions of people who do want these answers. They do want to know the details. They have lots of questions. And I think as a community, and especially as scientists, it's our job to go more than halfway to try to answer those questions as, as best we can. But that said, that's not most people. Most people are too busy, they're too, uh, you know, got too many other things that they're having to deal with, they don't have the background, they don't have the training. And the fact is, is that for better or for worse, climate change is just one of many, many other such, you know, hazards, risks, issues, news stories that people are are trying to at least uh, pay it somewhat attention to. So the real question is what do people need to know for most people and especially when you got to remember that most people have limited shelf space in their head for this issue. So in the course of our work and some of our colleagues around the country we think we've nailed it down to basically five key ideas um, that we've even further reduced into the form of a haiku. So here you go, uh, unleashed upon the world is uh, our haiku, which is this. One, scientists agree. Two, it's real. Three, it's us. Four, it's bad. And five, but there's hope, okay? And, you know, for all the complexity of this issue, and it is complex, we think that for most people, these are the basic facts that they need to understand about climate change. Um, first of all, scientists agree. This is a really important one, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, but we know that for many people, you know, if you're not an expert in this, you look to experts to guide you. Okay? And if your perception is that the experts are still arguing with each other over whether the problem even exists, many people take what's called a wait and see attitude, essentially, to say, okay, scientists, go off in a room somewhere, you haggle it out, when, if, when you figure out that it's real, you'll come and tell me, right? Well, in this case, of course, they don't know is that the scientific community did that decades ago. Uh, I'll come back to this point. Uh, but secondly, it's real, that this is happening. This isn't a hoax, it's not being made up, it's not that we don't fully understand the system yet, all that, we know that this is happening. And third, and crit critically, that it's us, it's human caused, not uh, just natural cycles or volcanoes or the sun or, or what have you. Uh, fourth, really important, that it's bad, that it's going to have lots of negative consequences. In fact, it's having negative consequences right here and right now, but of course that they're going to get much worse if we continue on the current pathway. And then last but not least is this element of hope, which otherwise could be, say, is uh, there are solutions. In fact, there are solutions here and now. It's not going to require moonshot, totally unheard of new technologies, though we certainly need to invest in some of those. But, you know, most of what we need to do, we can do uh, with uh, existing uh, capabilities. So these are five deceptively simple 
ideas. In fact, I would call them meta ideas because each of them can be basically explained and fleshed out with dozens and dozens of examples. Here are all the different ways that we know that it's actually happening. Here's all the ways that we know that it's human and not natural. Here's the thousands of ways that it's bad now and it's going to get much, much worse. But in the end, each of those examples is essentially reinforcing, building up the basic understanding in people's heads that these five things are, in fact, true. Okay, so having said that, how are we doing uh, in this country? So, uh, well, I'm sorry, one other last important point, and that is that we also see back to this concept of uh, the scientific consensus being such an important factor is that we've done a lot of research now, as have uh, some of our colleagues, that show that this is essentially what we call a gateway belief, that the more people understand that the experts agree, the more they in turn say, well, then I think it's real, and I think it's human caused, and I think it's bad, especially for people, uh, and I think it's solvable. Um, and in turn, that makes them more likely to support action on climate change, to support cl specific climate policies, and even to say that they're willing to get engaged politically uh, and through consumer activism. And again, that's not a big shock because, again, if your perception is that the experts still haven't even agreed whether the problem exists, uh, many people will take that wait-and-see attitude. So again, how are we doing on these key beliefs? Well, unfortunately, very few Americans uh, uh, currently understand the scientific consensus. Now, this consensus that I'm referring to is not about what are the projections of well, what climate change is going to do to Connecticut in the year 2065. Okay, that's hard, complicated, and you know, uh, the best we can do is come up with, with good scenarios and, and probability-based estimates. This is just simply the question, is it real, is it happening, and is it human caused, about which there is literally zero scientific debate. And yet, only 12% of Americans, only about 1 in 10, understands that by multiple studies from different techniques, we know that it's about 97% of climate scientists are convinced, based upon the evidence, that uh, human-caused global warming is happening. So. That's really consequential. It just shows that most people are still confused about the nature of uh, the field of, of climate science. Um, and that has, again, all kinds of real world consequences. So that's a number that needs to shift. All right. But when we go on to other things, uh, well, and I, by the way, I'm going to break this down with both national numbers and then I'm going to look more specifically because. You know, it is 2016, we are having an election year, and so I'm going to break it down by Democrat versus Republican uh, for many of these key issues. And so, again, this is, again, pointing out that, um, you know, relatively few Americans understand uh, the consensus. Uh, this is actually data from uh, March, uh, just uh, literally a couple weeks ago, so this is really fresh, and in fact, I don't, oh yeah, no, we did publish this uh, actually a couple weeks ago, so uh, uh, this is very um new data, but basically what you see is that even among liberal Democrats, okay, who are the most engaged with this issue, only 38% of them understand that consensus. So there's a lot of misunderstanding out there. Okay, how about whether uh, it's actually happening? Well, uh, as of just a couple weeks ago, 70% of Americans overall uh, think that global warming is happening, and that is near record high levels. And we haven't seen this since back in 2008, which was, if you remember back then, that was kind of the high water mark of uh, public engagement with the issue. Uh, that was back uh, just before uh, the cap and trade uh, initiative. Uh, was after you know many years of really an upsurge in public engagement with the issue around inconvenient truth and what Arnold Schwarzenegger was doing and uh, IPCC reports and so on and so forth. Um, it went through a major decline, though, from 2008 to 2010. As you can see, that was a 14 percentage point drop in public acceptance that this is even real. Uh, and since then, it's been bubbling back up, and now we're back uh, to 70 percent. Okay, um, but that, of course, differs depending on who you're looking at. And this is where some of the numbers have been really interesting uh, that we've just seen in the past couple of weeks. So first of all, among all registered voters, so that's over here on the left, you can see that there's been about a seven-point increase in acceptance that global warming is happening uh, 
in just the past two years. And by the way, these are just registered voters. That's why it's different than the prior, prior slide, which was all Americans. So now we're narrowing our, our focus to just registered voters. So a substantial seven-point increase here. But interestingly, there's been no change among Democrats. Okay? And in fact, you can see there's been no change among liberal Democrats or moderate conservative Democrats. The real shift in these numbers is coming from independents, where you've got a 15-point jump here, and especially among Republicans, where it's been a 16-point jump. And when we break that down further uh, for the two parties, we see it's especially true among conservative Republicans, who have uh, increased their, uh, uh, their level of being convinced by 19 percentage points in the past two years. That's a big shift. Um, now, granted, it's still less than 50 percent. It's 47 percent. But this is real progress, given where climate change has been, uh, certainly among the Republican Party uh, for the past several years, where uh, it got pretty bleak there for quite a while, where you know, kind of the party line uh, was this notion that it's a hoax, that it's uh, made up, and that it's not even a real problem. So that's been an encouraging shift. But when we look at human causation, that has not changed as much. So people are becoming more convinced it's real, but they don't yet, uh, they haven't yet shifted their views around that it's human caused. And there we see that it's still at about 53% uh, who think it's mostly human caused. Um, that really hasn't changed much over the many, many years now. And when we break that down by, uh, by political party, uh, and again, this is limited to just registered voters, uh, so among registered voters, 56% accept that it's human caused. Uh, still, though, you got a third who think it's mostly natural. Uh, this is very different for Democrats. So 75% of Democrats overall think it's human caused. 82% uh, of liberal Democrats, 66% of moderate conservative Democrats. But when you get to the liberal moderate uh, Republicans, I mean, this is now uh, they are more likely to think it's happening, but it's still 49 uh, and it's really among conservative Republicans where if they accept that it's real, uh, they're much more likely to think it's natural. Okay, so uh, still a fair amount of confusion out there nationally on that. Um, and that in turn translates to the fact that very few Americans are very worried about this issue. So as of just a few weeks ago, basically these numbers haven't changed much, uh, at least in the past uh, six months. Uh, and we find that only about 16% of Americans say that they're very worried about the issue. And that also translates to um, Democrats and Republicans again. So again, only 16% of all registered voters. Um, you know, when you get over to liberal Democrats, all right, 31%, but only a third uh, are particularly worried. 23% of moderate conservative Democrats and very few uh, among Republicans. Now, there's a lot of reasons uh, for why you see uh, that in general uh, Americans don't see climate change as a, as a you know, very worrisome threat. But one of the most important that we've seen for many years is the fact that for many people it's perceived as distant, that the impacts are distant in time. In other words, we won't see impacts for a generation or more, and distant in space, that this is about polar bears or maybe some developing countries, but not the United States, not Connecticut, not New Haven, not my friends and family, or any of the people and places that I care about. Um, and as a result, it's psychologically distant. It's one of those issues that's out there, you know, maybe I wish somebody would do something about it, but it's not much of a concern and, frankly, not much of a priority. And that's what we see consistently on uh, the priority measures. And I'm sure you've all seen this before. This one happens to come from the Pew Research Center from maybe a month ago. Um, and consistently, when you look at you know how important are each of these issues for the president and Congress, uh, climate change shows up uh, pretty much near the bottom. Uh, and sure enough, it is uh, again this year. What's interesting, however, is that this number, 38%, was actually just 25% two years ago. So that's a pretty big jump uh, in uh, this number in that same time period. So yes, it's still at the bottom of the list. So it must be said it's on the list. <laughs> that is something to be said that many other issues are not. Um, but, uh, uh, but does seem to be moving in some interesting directions. And we can take a closer look at that. Now, this is uh, our version of this question where we say, you know, do you think each of these issues should be a low, medium, high, or very high priority for the next president and Congress? 
And so here we're just looking at the long-term trend of those people who say it should be a very high priority. And what you see is a very interesting pattern over the past few years. Essentially, Republicans haven't shifted at all. Um, but you've seen a big jump among Democrats and a pretty substantial increase among independents as well. So that's where it seems to be happening. And here's one other look at this, and this I think is a really, really interesting uh, finding that we just released, and that is that uh, when we break it down by liberal Democrats, moderate conservative Democrats, liberal moderate Republicans, and conservative Republicans, and then we just rank order the issues, we find that for the first time, global warming is now number six among liberal Democrats, which I think is frankly amazing. Um, and moreover, protecting the environment is number four, and developing clean sources of uh, developing sources of clean energy is number eight. So, in the environment, global warming, and clean energy are all three of the top eight uh, priorities for liberal Democrats. Think of that as essentially the liberal base. Um, you know, it's about a mid-tier priority for moderate and conservative Republicans, or, I'm sorry, Democrats, and then, of course, once you get down to the Republican side, it's much, much lower. Um, so clearly there's a lot to be done here, especially on this side of the fence, but uh, this, I think, is really uh, quite amazing uh, to see, and I think it's beginning to play uh, an important role, certainly in the presidential election, which we can get into in terms of Sanders versus Clinton. Okay. Um, so do people then support policies to deal with this? So, you know, uh, on one level, uh, there's still a fair amount of confusion out there about the nature and the reality and the seriousness of climate change. Um, but that doesn't always mean that people can't, in fact, support policies for completely different reasons. So let's get into that a bit. So here's the Obama Clean Power Plan, essentially, um, and uh, in a relatively uh, severe framing of it. So setting strict carbon dioxide limits on existing coal-fired power plants to reduce global warming and improve public health. Power plants would have to reduce their emissions and or invest in renewable energy and energy efficiency. The cost of electricity to consumers and companies would likely increase. So no free lunch here. Uh, and still, you find that 70% of registered voters support this, 88% of Democrats, about half of Republicans overall. But here's the real difference. Uh, you know, almost unanimously among liberal Democrats uh, and moderate conservatives, two-thirds of liberal moderate Republicans, but the opposition is primarily coming from conservative uh, Republicans. Um, and when we break that down into additional uh, uh, policies, you see some other interesting patterns. So, for example, funding more research into renewable energy sources such as solar and wind overwhelming public support for this. 84% of all voters, 91% uh, of Democrats, 95% of liberal Democrats, and even 72% of conservative Republicans support investments in clean energy. And I think this is just one indication of many other questions we've asked that show us over and over again, people really like clean energy. Um, uh, they're very committed, in fact, to making the transition from fossil fuels, uh, older, dirty energy, to the new clean energy future of the 21st century. Uh, we have near unanimity in this country about that. Um, I think the big issue that most people have not yet fully understood is that for many people, they still think of clean energy as kind of in the line of the Jetsons. I may be dating myself here, but, you know, in the same sense that, you know, one day we're all going to be, uh, you know, in flying cars, and won't that be cool? Um, I think there's still that kind of perception around clean energy is that many people still think it's like not here yet. It's still off in the future. Of course, as everyone I'm sure on this call knows, that's just not true. Uh, it's here, it's now, it's already reaching price parity in many places uh, across the country and around the world, uh, often cheaper, in fact, uh, in some places around the world. So that's just something that is shifting as this industry, as this whole field matures, but it's also a message that people haven't yet really heard. Um, likewise, very strong support for tax rebates for people who buy energy efficient vehicles or solar panels, even 65% of conservative Republicans support that. Regulating carbon dioxide as a pollutant, so this is a different way of framing the Clean Power Plan. Again, 75% of American uh, of registered voters approve of that. Uh, just over half of conservatives uh, support that as well. 
um, requiring fossil fuel companies to pay a carbon tax and using the money to reduce other taxes, such as income tax, by an equal amount. Over two-thirds of registered voters support that, and uh, you know, very clear, strong support among Democrats, even two-thirds support among independents, um, it's real, and even two-thirds support among liberal, moderate Republicans. It's, again, really conservatives who are not convinced by this concept. Uh, a lot more could be said around uh, different ways of pricing carbon, uh, and so if people have questions about that, we can get into that later. Um, but of course, on the other hand, and we just put this one in here to show that, you know, that it doesn't all go in one direction, expand offshore drilling for oil and natural gas. Uh, again, a majority of Americans support that, but uh, a minority primarily among Democrats, strong majorities among uh, Republicans. Okay, and then uh, another way of just looking at this concept of, uh, of pricing carbon uh, or taxes on, uh, on fuels uh, is uh, this question, is, would you be more or less likely to vote for a candidate who supports increasing taxes on fossil fuels if these tax revenues were used to, and just as an aside, we've looked at a variety of different ways that, you know, depending on how you propose to use the revenue, that actually can have a pretty significant impact on how much support people have for the policy. So in this case, what we find is that the things that they like the most are taking that money and investing it in the development of clean energy. So basically taxing dirty energy in people's minds to taking that money and investing it in the clean energy future. Uh, that's actually generally the strongest support that we find. Um, and note here that it's just over 50% say that that would make them much more or somewhat more likely to vote for a candidate. Uh, this, these people say it really wouldn't make any difference. Uh, it's only 17% who say that it would make them less likely to vote for such a candidate. So, you know, it's basically you should be looking at the blue versus the red in terms of uh, potential uh, election consequences. Uh, but people also like the idea of using it to offset, you know, a, a tax that everybody knows and often doesn't particularly like to pay, and that's the federal income tax. Um, so uh, that basically is an equivalent uh, scoring uh, kind of use of the revenue uh, as uh, taking the money and instead uh, investing it in clean energy. Much less support for helping to pay down the national debt. Um, and in fact, we've looked at other kinds of policies like you know, reducing corporate taxes, uh, reducing payroll taxes, and so on, and generally those don't perform as well either. Okay. So as uh, many of you may know, uh, we've also been doing a lot of work to really look at, you know, who is the American public? And of course, there is no single public. Uh, and in our work, we've identified what we call global warming, six Americas, these six different groups within the United States that each respond to this issue in very different ways. And from a communication standpoint, that's really important because one of the very first principles of effective communication is know thy audience. Uh, who are they? What do they understand? What do they think they understand? Uh, what are their emotional responses? What are their underlying values? Who do they trust? Where do they get their news and information from? And so on. Uh, these are the kinds of questions that we've uh, spent many years now uh, really developing, and I won't do them any justice here whatsoever. I would encourage you, if you want to really dig into who these different audiences are and how to best engage them, I'd encourage you to come to our website and look at some of our uh, reports and uh, chapters on this. But here, I'm just going to make the point that there are these six different groups. Uh, first is a group that we call the alarmed. These are people who are firmly convinced it's happening, human-caused, uh, hum uh, urgent, and strongly support policy action. Um, these are the group that you might think of as the issue public. So there's a political science term for basically uh, that group of citizens that are the most mobilized or at least potentially mobilized to demand uh, uh, large-scale action. And, and you're actually quite familiar with issue publics. I mean, think of the pro or anti-immigration movement or the pro-choice or, oh, just making sure that, is this still working? Okay, I'm getting. Oh, I think we've had a glitch. Uh... Give me one moment. Okay. It looks like our our internet has failed. Please bear with us a moment while we work through this.
Okay, Tony, go ahead and uh, go to your quick start, and sh and you should be able to share the screen again. Okay. Uh, it says that I'm sharing my screen now. So can you not see it? Change. There we go. Yep, we're back on. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay, so I, I'm sorry. I was just uh, saying that uh, other examples of issue publics are the pro or anti-immigration movement, the pro or anti, uh, the pro-choice or anti-abortion movement, um, pro-gun control or anti-gun control movements. The difference, though, is that those are organized movements. Uh, think of the NRA. That's a powerful institution with millions of members. Uh, they have they have and exert political muscle on the. Uh, on the political system. There is not yet an equivalent uh, powerful, politically powerful climate movement, not yet anyway. Um, this number, by the way, represents about 38 million Americans. Um, and about half of them tell us that they would personally join a campaign to convince elected officials to take action on climate change. So that's about 19 million people. That's a lot. I mean, no issue public that I just mentioned has anywhere close to 19 million uh, people in it. Um, but the key difference, again, is that those groups are organized. This group is mostly latent. Um, then comes a group we call the Concerned, 29% uh, as of a year ago. Um, might be actually a little bigger now. Uh, these are people who think it's happening, human-caused, serious. Uh, but, again, they tend to think of it as distant, distant time, distant space. So while they do support action, they're not particularly, they don't give it a particularly high priority. They think we got other things we need to worry about as well. Uh, then comes a group we call the cautious. You can think of the, them as uh, fence sitters, paying attention but haven't really made up their mind. Is it real? Is it not? Is it human? Is it natural? Is it serious or is it kind of overblown? Uh, again, paying attention but uh, still on the fence. Uh, then comes a group that we call the disengaged. These are people who say, you know, I've heard of global warming, but I don't know anything about it. I don't know what the causes are. I don't know what the consequences are. I certainly don't know what the solutions are. So really the main thing holding them back in many ways is just basic awareness. Uh, when you look at their values, actually, their values are very similar to the alarmed. Um, but they have not been engaged in the issue. Um, then comes a group that we call the doubtful, uh, and these are people who basically say, ah, I don't think it's real, but if it is, it's natural, uh, you know, natural factors, uh, you know, cycles in Earth's history, et cetera. Nothing we have anything to do with, therefore nothing we can do anything about. So they don't think about it that much, and they don't see it as a risk. And then last but not least are those that we call the dismissive, and they're firmly convinced that it's not happening, it's not human cause, uh, it's not a serious problem, and most of whom, uh, basically tell us quite directly that they're conspiracy theorists. Uh, you know, this is a hoax. This is scientists making up data. This is a UN plot to take away our sovereignty. This is a get rich scheme by Al Gore and his friends and many, many other such narratives. Now, importantly, this group is only 11%. Okay, it's only 11%, but it's a really loud and vocal 11%. Uh, in fact, uh, when we've gone and our colleagues have done analyses of, say, the comment sections on articles online, say USA Today on climate change, uh, you'll find that half or more of the comments are often from people in this camp. Uh, and so what they've very successfully done is they've created the impression that they are half or more of the country. They're not. But when you look at this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of communication, it's very easy to come away f uh, as a journalist, as a policymaker, as a member of the public, with this false impression that it's half or more of the country. But it's not. It just happens to be very loud. Um, okay, so those are the, the six different groups. And just to reinforce the point that there are completely different conversations. People are engaged in this issue at completely different stages. Um, we can uh, look at this question in which we've asked people, if you could ask an expert on global warming one question, which question would you ask? So down here, the doubtful and dismissive, their primary question is, how do you know that global warming is happening or human caused? And on a deeper level, they're really asking, and why should I trust you? Okay, Because often they're not hearing that it's happening in human cause from people, from messengers that they trust. Then comes uh, the groups in the middle, uh, the cautious and the disengaged, and they're like, okay, maybe it's real, but so what? Why should I care? What's this got to do with me? And then these groups over here, the alarmed and the concerned, 
are saying, yeah, all right, I got it. It's real, it's human cause, it's serious, but what do we do? And this is really, I think, uh, has been up until pretty recently a major failing of the climate community, that in essence we have done a far better job communicating the problem to these folks than we have the solutions. And that's, again, why even the alarm, the people who are the most concerned about this issue, many of them don't know what, in fact, they can do as individuals or what we collectively can do to address it. And as a result, we're beginning to see just the be and again, just the beginnings of a comment from people in the alarm asking the question, is it too late? Are we doomed? Okay. That's a really dangerous attitude to end up in because basically that suggests that there's nothing we can do, that this fatalistic. And to quote Henry Ford, uh, who once famously said, um, those who think they can and those who think they can't are both right. In other words, if you don't think you can solve something, you're highly unlikely to take action to do it. Um, and in fact, the good news is that's not the situation at all. There's a tremendous amount that we can do to reduce uh, the impacts of climate change. Not avoid them entirely, by no means, but we can make a big difference. Okay, so one last point I want to make about this, and that is the role of underlying values. And in particular, what we see is that um, one of the important predictors of how people respond to climate change is their allegiance to particular value systems. We, we call them worldviews that are actually deeper than being a Democrat or a Republican, deeper than being a liberal or a conservative. It's essentially people who adhere to what we call an egalitarian worldview. In other words, they tell us things like there's too much discrimination in society, that the government should be trying to eradicate poverty, that uh, inequities of wealth uh, are too big and they create conflict both within countries and across the world. Um, none of those questions are directly tied to climate change, and yet people with that worldview are the ones who are the most concerned about climate change. They tend to be these people up here in the alarm to concern. By contrast, people with a different worldview, what we call an individualistic worldview, who say, you know, for them, the primary value of trumping all other values is individual liberty, individual freedom, individual autonomy, and that's usually phrased as anti-government. Government's too big, it's too intrusive, too much taxation, too much regulation. I'm, I'm sure you all know this. this is, these are, uh, you know, talking points that you've heard for years now. Um, certainly among uh, more conservative bases. Um, that's where the dismissive tend to be. And as a result, that's kind of the values through which they interpret the issue of climate change. Um, and, and in fact, both in a sense are afraid of climate change, but for completely different reasons. The alarmed are afraid of climate change because of all the impacts of climate change and what they fear it's gonna do to both people and to, uh, 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 you know, natural ecosystems and other species around the world. Uh, by contrast, the dismissive are afraid of climate change too, but not climate change, which they don't think is real. What they're afraid of is the policy response to climate change. Because when you look at climate change, of course, it is the mother of all collective action problems. There is no way that each of us through, you know, good, virtuous individual action, you know, reducing our own carbon footprint, investing in more energy efficiency, you know, all the changing the way we eat, all those good things that we can do. And if, if we did them collectively, it would be a significant contribution. Let's not downgrade that. In fact, my colleagues, uh, have, other colleagues have estimated that U.S., if all Americans did good, common sense things to reduce their own emissions, collectively we could reduce national emissions by maybe 10 to 12 percent, and that would be an enormous contribution to solving the problem. But it's only 10 to 12 percent. The other, uh, uh, the rest of this has got to come from systemic change, and that's going to require some role of government at local levels, at the state level, at the national level, and yes, at the global scale, because again, the U.S. can't do this by itself either. And as soon as you start talking about international cooperation, for some of these people in the dismissive, they start seeing visions of black helicopters in their head. Uh, this just ties right into their conspiracy theories about the UN trying to take over the United States. Okay? And as a result, for that kind of anti-government, anti-regulatory standpoint, they hate policies like regulating CO2 as a pollutant or requiring a 20% renewable portfolio standard. They don't like that at all, whereas the alarmed love it. But then there are these issues like clean energy and uh, 
support for consumers to buy fuel efficient vehicles or, um, or solar panels. They generally like this, okay? Not as much as Alarm, but they, uh, but they are more in the somewhat support uh, level. Why is that? Uh, because it often, they see these kinds of policies as resonating with their values. And the best way to explain that is through the story of what happened in the state of Georgia. In Georgia, uh, there's uh, predominantly one uh, major electricity producer and distributor, that's the utility Georgia Power. Uh, they basically had a monopoly, that's a pretty good business to have. Uh, and they had uh, structured the system so homeowners who installed solar panels on their roof could not sell their electricity back into the grid. Um, so in response, the uh, Sierra Club in Georgia partnered with the Atlanta Tea Party. So just put that together in your head. The Sierra Club partnered with the Tea Party to fight that regulation, okay? And in fact, they won. They won twice. Uh, and now solar uh, panels can be put on roofs and those homeowners can sell their electricity into the grid. So why would they do this? Well, the Sierra Club's easy to understand. They care about climate change. Why did the Tea Party do this when they, most of them don't even believe in climate change? Because this particular policy resonates with their values about individual freedom, about individual autonomy, and that most New England of values, self-reliance. I should be able to do what I want with my castle. I should be able to produce my own energy and not be dependent on uh, a utility, for example. Um, and that coalition, of course, they don't agree about lots of other stuff, but they did find that they do agree about a number of issues, and they've gone on and are now uh, affectionately called the Green Tea Party. Um, so the point here is that sometimes you can find policies that attract strange bedfellows, right? Or as the old uh, religious phrase says, there are many roads to Damascus. Sometimes uh, uh, people will, re will come to support the exact same policies for completely different reasons, and that's the art of politics. Okay, so last thing I want to do quickly is to say that we've, you know, all this stuff that I've been talking about thus far has been at the national scale, and many people say, okay, well, that's really helpful, thank you, but tell me about what's going on uh, where I live, because I'm actually working at the state level or I'm working at the local level, and these national numbers don't really help me all that much. So to address that, uh, about a year and a half ago, we developed a new tool, uh, a, a statistical model that we validated, and we found that it's uh, incredibly accurate, and it, for the first time, allows us to uh, see what is the state of public opinion, uh, perceived risk, policy support uh, for all 50 states, for all 435 congressional districts, for every county in America, every city in America, and so on. So for those of you who haven't seen it, um, I'm gonna quickly drop out of this and come over here. And this is our website, and this is all publicly available, so I'd encourage you to come play around because it's a fun tool. Um, climatecommunication.yale.edu, and it's under visualizations and data. And let's just expand this. Um, and this is what we call the Yale Climate Opinion Maps. And so here's essentially what I've been talking about, right? Uh, at the national level, you know that 63% of Americans, as of, this is about uh, in 2014, so we're updating this, and we'll have this updated in the next week or two. Um, but still, here's the national number. Okay, that's fine, but that doesn't help me very much. What about at the state level? Well, you can see that, in fact, uh, there's a fair amount of variation around the country. And in fact, just to kind of em emphasize that, let's go down to worry. And we see that levels of worry uh, vary quite a bit. Now, I'm sure most people here are immediately going right here to Connecticut. 56% uh, of people in Connecticut uh, are worried about global warming. Uh, that's in contrast to only 43% in, say, North Dakota. Um, but we can break it down further by congressional district or all the way down to the county level, and let's just go ahead and zoom in to show you what else you can do with the tool. So here you can zoom in, and I happen to have chosen Middlesex, but let's choose New Haven. 56% um, of people in New Haven are very or somewhat worried about uh, global warming. That compares to 56% uh, across Connecticut, only 52% across the U.S. So Connecticut's a little bit higher than the national average. And then uh, down below, you can see here's this the results for New Haven on all of the issues or all of the variables that we have provided. So you can look at this at many different scales. And then here are the different um, uh, variables that we have measured. So I'm zooming back out very quickly. 
you can see that there's tremendous diversity around the country. And just to take one example of some of the interesting things that uh, get revealed from this is Texas. Uh, you know, Texas is stereotypically a deep red, very conservative state, was for many years led by Rick Perry, a climate denying governor. Uh, you would often think that this is the last place you'd ever want to be uh, trying to engage people around climate change. But what we see is that that's in fact not true. That right here, especially along the border, are places that, you know, 61%, uh, 60%, 60% uh, are worried about climate change. This is as high as some parts of California. Okay, so what's going on there? Uh, that is uh, what we've seen in some of our other research is in particular the role and effect of Latinos. That in fact, uh, although the common wisdom is that climate change is an upper middle, a white upper middle class environmentalist issue, um, in fact, when we look at, uh, at the issue by race and ethnicity, it's Latinos who care more about climate change than any other racial or ethnic group in the United States. They're more convinced it's happening. They're more convinced it's human cause. They're more worried about it. They're more supportive of policy action. However, they are less likely to be politically or socially engaged than most other Americans. So there's this really interesting paradox or gap between their uh, greater concern on the one hand, and yet uh, less action, at least thus far. So that's actually beginning to raise interesting questions for people who are trying to engage uh, Americans uh, to address the issue. So anyway, I encourage you to come take a look at, at the map. And, you know, there are also some policies here, you know, on clean energy that just importantly needs to be said. This is supported everywhere, you know, even Texas, even Oklahoma. I mean, Oklahoma here, 73% of people in these counties support clean energy. Uh, regulation uh, CO2 is a pollutant, highly supported everywhere in America. Uh, the more uh, stronger way of describing this, of saying strict CO2 limits on existing coal-fired power plants, now you begin to find some places like in West Virginia that don't uh, support that as much. But again, across the whole country, uh, pretty high. Uh, you know, here's a renewable portfolio standard. Uh, you know, we can zoom in here on Connecticut again. And you see that people across the state pretty much uh, support that kind of a policy. So anyway, we hope that this is a, a useful tool to you as uh, you, uh, you try to engage the public in your own efforts. And with that, uh, happy to take some questions. Thank you, Tony. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, and we have a lot of questions that have rolled in, so I will just uh, start reading them out. Um, first question is, uh, are you communicating um, your findings to Connecticut legislators or working with them in any way? Uh, no, not yet, but would, ha would be more than happy to. Great. Uh, what methods have been effective to counter the pseudoscientific messaging that seeks to Obf I can't say the word, obfuscate the scientific consensus. Right. So, um, first of all, uh, and we've done a lot of uh, not just survey work, but even message testing work, and what we have found repeatedly uh, is that simply exposing people to this message, 97% of climate scientists are convinced, based upon the evidence, that human-caused global warming is happening. We find that on average, we can move Americans 20 percentage points in their perception of that consensus, and that that then in turn has positive uh, consequences on their own acceptance that it's real, that it's human caused, that it's uh, serious, and in turn, their support for policy. Uh, and that's after one exposure, okay? This is not what we would actually do in a campaign, right? Because you know, if there's a formula, and there is no simple formula, but I'm going to give you a simple formula because it's generally very true, is that to be effective, you want simple, clear, and compelling messages repeated often, 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 repeated often. Like, and I just did that seven times, okay? And I bet you're going to remember now, repeated often. <laughs> um, that's so important, and as a community, we suck at this. I, I just cannot underscore this enough. We constantly think, hey, I said it once. I put it in a report. I put it in a peer-reviewed paper. You all got it now, right? No, no. 
you need to get to the point where you're so sick of hearing the same words coming out of your mouth again, that's probably the time at which point your audience is actually finally beginning to hear you. So we got to repeat it. Uh, and the third part of that uh, is by a variety of trusted messengers. Uh, and messenger really matters, okay? The fact that, you know, former Vice President Al Gore became the public face of this issue in the early 2000s uh, was both incredibly positive because he, will, he was deeply trusted and even loved by many in the liberal democratic base. And I think he deserves enormous credit for engaging that liberal democratic base. I think he's a major reason why we see it's now at number six among liberal Democrats. But at the same time, there are just as many people who detest Al Gore um, and would never uh, uh, have voted for him or trust him. And they don't, people are not capable of making a distinction in their heads between well, I believe Al Gore when he talks about science, but I hate Al Gore, the politician, and when he criticizes the Iraq War and criticizes, you know, George W. Bush and, you know, and so on and so forth. No, uh, people see people uh, interpret messengers as one and the same, and unfortunately, that's one of the reasons why the issue has become so politically polarized. So. Uh, you know, as general principles, I would just say that the simpler you can make your message, the more often you can repeat it, and in the case of the scientific consensus, we show that it works quite well, and I should have also said that it works particularly well with conservative Republicans. It works better with conservative Republicans than it does with any of the other uh, political uh, groups. Um, and uh, again, by a variety of trusted messengers, it really makes a big difference. Great, thank you. Um, a follow-up to that is, do you have a, uh, a suggestion on resources and presentation templates on your five key ideas? How can folks at the local level here in Connecticut help communicate these ideas? Uh, let's see, I mean, we don't really have, I'm trying to think if we have anything else that can do that well. No, uh, that's a great idea. It's something we probably should be thinking about is assembling essentially a library of maybe images and you know, text and so on that really help emphasize that. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the main thing that we've done to try to do that is work with others. So for example, we have a now five or six year old pro project working with uh, broadcast meteorologists across the country, weathercasters, um, who uh, are actually very much trusted. Uh, and, um, and we've seen really remarkable changes, I think in no small part because of this project. Uh, where they now accept that climate change is happening and it is human caused and it is already showing up in weather extremes in their own areas when that's scientifically appropriate conclusion to make uh, and are beginning to engage their audiences on this. So that's at least uh, one of the ways that we've tried uh, to address that. Great, well maybe we should chat further about Connecticut specifically. <laughs> Something, another thing to put on the list to do. Um, okay, so Two more questions. Uh, what are the most critical, oh no, I think you answered that. Do you think that recent anti-establishment political trends may translate into disbelief in experts, even if there is a recognition that the experts have already reached consensus? Not really, um, no. I mean, we've been tracking trust in climate scientists over the years, and we did see a dip when, um, for instance, in that critical period of 2009, 2010. ClimateGate was part of that. Uh, if you remember this pseudo uh, scandal where some uh, emails were hacked, uh, emails were gone through, some phrases were taken out completely out of context and then used as waved around uh, by opponents of climate action as you know, proof that this uh, wasn't actually real and that scientists were making this all up. Um, that had an impact at that time, but you know, to be honest, the vast majority of Americans don't remember that at all. Uh, we've moved on long since. Uh, and trust levels are back to where they were. And it basically, people have very, very high regard for climate scientists. So, you know, there is an, an undercurrent and there is a small proportion of people who are deeply suspicious of any kinds of experts. And in fact, that's one of the critical definitions of a conspiracy theorist is that essentially they don't trust anyone in authority at all. 
And that's why you get these really funny and interesting paradoxes among, uh, say, conspiracy theorists. So I'm actually quoting a, a study that found this. Uh, there are people who believe that Princess Diana was murdered uh, in that uh, tunnel. Uh, and those same people also endorse the fact that she's still alive and hiding on an island in the Caribbean. Okay. Now, you know, logically that's not possible. <laughs> um, but what's really going on is that they have this deeper, deeper distrust of any kind of authority, any kind of official line from government, from media, uh, it's, or experts, or whatever. And that's what gets expressed. That's why they're willing to to entertain, you know, narratives, storylines that you know clearly contradict with one another. Okay, um, with the benefit of your profiling of Americans, do you have insights on how to present issues in a way that is one, effective, and two, avoids making people angry and defensive? Oh my, that's a big question. Um, you know, I would say the first and most important thing to do when you're engaging with people is, well, let me say two quick things. First is remember that there are these six different Americas and don't be intimidated, don't be cowed, don't be forced into the, into the zone of silence, the cone of silence, by the dismissive. And we've seen this over and over and over again with, you know, uh, government officials, with the media, with NGO groups, uh, with, you know, docents at museums with climate exhibits who are afraid to talk about the issue uh, with people because they're afraid of getting attacked by a dismissive. The dismissive are only 11%, and most of them aren't going to get in your face about this. Um, and what we see that's so tragic is that in the effort to avoid that conflict, people are afraid to talk about climate change, which means that they don't talk about it with all the rest of the country, all the other six Americas, who in fact are open to talking about it. In fact, many of them want to talk about it because they are trying to figure out what is this issue and what does it mean for me. Um, so we're actually finding that a lot of these organizations are doing a huge disservice to their own members, to their own visitors, because they don't talk about it. And that's just letting you know, the tail literally wag the dog. Um, so I, first of all, I would just say don't be afraid to talk about it. But secondly, is you know it's about having a conversation. This isn't a, ultimately about just providing information in a one-way, unidirectional. Uh, uh, you know, that's not a conversation. It's a speech where uh, essentially you're saying, "Here's what I know. I want you to know what I know." Uh, I think we've got to move this as much as we can, wherever appropriate into a conversation um, where we listen uh, at least as much as we speak um, and at least try to establish the common grounds on which we all care about. There are core fundamental values that everybody agrees about. Um, there are fundamental experiences that are both shared and different that we need to talk about in relation to this as well as, and we haven't even talked about this here, the emotional responses that this issue engenders, because it does. We treat it as a scientific issue. We treat it about just hear the facts, just accept the facts, without really acknowledging that this issue raises really deep and profound emotional reactions in people. And we have to navigate those, uh, because to ignore them is to ignore what's often really going on. Um, we have two more questions, and I will run uh, close to time, but I think it's important to get them out there. Um, the first one being, why are you using the term global warming and uh, not climate change in your survey? Okay, that's the probably the most often asked question. Uh, because when we, well, a couple of reasons. When we started this project back in, uh, actually all the way back in early 2000s, but also in 2008, global warming at the time was uh, by far the most commonly used phrase in public discourse and in the media. Um, but we w always want to question, you know, what we're doing. And so just about maybe a year and a half ago, uh, we did a big national study where we basically implemented the exact same survey uh, one using the term global warming, the other using the term climate change, and just saw how people uh, respond. And what we find very clearly, and it's on our website, it's called What's in a Name? Global Warming versus Climate Change. I encourage you to come take a look at it. Uh, we find very clearly that global warming is still the more commonly term, more commonly uh, used term, uh, both that what people say they see and that they hear and that they use personally. Um, 
people are more convinced that global warming is happening than climate change. They're more convinced that it's human caused than global warming. Uh, they're more worried about global warming than climate change. I'm sorry, I got that wrong in that last one. Global warming versus climate change. Uh, they're more supportive of action to deal with global warming and climate change. And that's a true across most demographics. And then for some demographics like Hispanics or, uh, or African Americans, the differences sometimes are huge, like 30 percentage points. So, you know, this is a, is a longer conversation, but, uh, you know, my general uh, advice is that it's, you know, all communication is context dependent. Context matters. If you have 30 seconds to talk to a reporter, let's say, uh, or to do an interview on television or on the radio, I would use the word global warming because most people are going to immediately understand what you're talking about. You know, if you've got an hour, though, use both terms. Use them interchangeably. In fact, season your talk with your own preferred term, whether it's climate chaos, climate disruption, Tom Friedman promotes global weirding, you know, whatever. Um, but, you know, for better or for worse, we are stuck with global warming and climate change from, you know, for at least the next decade and probably a lot longer than that. Um, I think it would take literally a generation and billions of dollars of sophisticated marketing to get people to no longer think of this issue in the terms of global warming or climate change. So embrace it, go with it, and uh, season it with your own favorite terms. Okay, and last question. What do you think of 350.org in terms of bringing the alarmed and concerned together into a powerful force? You said that there has been much progress in building momentum. Sorry, there has not been much progress in building momentum. What is 350.org lacking? Oh my. Uh, well, let's see. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know that I would specifically focus on 350. 350, I think, has done some really innovative things. I don't think they're actually engaging the concern much at all. I think their their bread and butter is the the most active, mobilized, willing to get involved members of the alarmed. And so, you know, the alarmed, as I said before, that's about 38 million Americans. I think 350 really is only appealing to a pretty narrow slice of, of those, the ones who are already primed and, and ready to, to, you know, take action. Um, and that's a critical role. I mean, I think 350 deserves a lot of credit for raising a lot of these issues into public consciousness and to giving people very active and, and direct and concrete things that they can do. Um, but, you know, this is a much bigger and, and richer landscape than just 350. I mean, there are so many groups that are doing this kind of work. I think actually the thing that I'm more concerned about isn't that there aren't groups out there, is that I think these groups don't coordinate enough. Um, you know, I think we have too much of what I sometimes call a let a thousand flowers bloom type strategy, or a better way of maybe putting it is, is like the difference between an incandescent light bulb and a laser when we compare what the climate advocacy community is doing versus that dismissive advocacy community. Um, you know, a, a, an incandescent light bulb and a laser, same amount of energy, completely different results. And the sad thing is that in this case, we're the dim bulbs. Um, you know, our light is diffuse, it's going every which way. A lot of it is inefficient and, and not particularly productive, whereas, you know, they're hyper-focused. Uh, they know exactly what their message is and they pound it, they repeat it over and over and over again. It doesn't matter whether it's true or not. They just say, it's the sun, it's the sun, it's the sun, or it's a hoax, it's a hoax, it's a hoax. Um, you know, they got their, their clear talking points and they just pound them. Um, so I would say that, if anything, the advocacy community just needs to get way better organized. Great. I think that's an excellent point. Okay. Um, I guess to wrap up, thank you very much. Um, people have asked if your slides would be available um, on our website, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to you whether or not you want to share your slides on our website. We do have the recording with the slides recorded uh, for folks who would like to pass it on to others or to um, view it again, I encourage you to go to our website. Um, and Tony, thank you again. This is really fascinating, and I think a lot of people were, um, learned a lot of information. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, and onward. Have a great day, folks. <laughs>